Welcome to the Osa Peninsula, a pocket of Costa Rica that National Geographic has labeled the most biologically intense place on Earth. It's only about 1,200 square kilometers, just over the size of Hong Kong, or about one hundred thousandth of the Earth's total land area. And yet, one out of every 40 of all the world species can be found in this tiny peninsula, a density of diversity that surpasses even much of the Amazon rainforest. This area, part of the broader Isthmian Pacific moist forest ecoregion, to the untrained eye, it looks a lot like some of the surrounding ecoregions. Lush, rainy forests, dense canopies, year-round heat and moisture creating a dizzying array of niches for all kinds of plants and animals to take up and occupy. Some swamp forests, the occasional cloud forest, nearby mangroves, and one could easily be excused for not noticing how much more diverse the Osa is compared to its neighbors. But the difference becomes noticeable when you really zoom in and start to study and catalog and add up species. Having a varied landscape, varied climate, and a dry season that isn't as dry seems to give it an advantage over some of its neighbors. And compared to, say, the Atlantic coast forests, you notice more species richness and higher levels of endemism, or species found only here. But in some ways, looking north into Central America and south into South America, the remarkable thing is not so much how dissimilar the Osa looks, but how much it shares with both. Like, don't get me wrong, there's plenty here that's unique, but almost more noteworthy is how much isn't. This is a meeting of two worlds, north and south, the blending of two continents. Many species of trees you'll find here are species you can find throughout a lot of the Amazon rainforest, but this, the Osa, is about the northern border of their range. Similarly, many plants here can be found as far north as Mexico and the Caribbean, but they don't go much further south than this. One multitude joins another, and you're left with this teeming and writhing explosion of life in all its wild and staggering diversity. And from a conservation standpoint, this presents a great opportunity. Many species found here are threatened in other parts of their range, and so this can possibly be one place to protect remnant populations for a lot of species all at once. But there is also a lot here left to discover as well. One estimate from a nearby part of the ecoregion found one in every 20 trees in the forest to be a species undescribed by science, meaning scientists haven't yet identified it, recorded it, and given it a scientific name and thus also haven't studied it for how it interacts with and supports the local ecosystems and how we might be able to use it. These species may of course be known to the local indigenous people, depending where they grow and how rare they are and whether the knowledge has been lost in recent times, but in any case this does give perspective on just how many species there are out there. And that number, 1 in 20, is just for trees. Shrubs, smaller ground plants, epiphytic plants growing up in the canopy, woody lianas, one of the less studied groups of plants, also add to this sheer diversity. But to make this place even more special, it is the last remaining chunk of intact old growth forest on the Pacific coast of Central America. There used to be more, but with agriculture logging and human settlements, it's largely been broken up, fragmented, deforested, and otherwise altered. The Osa has an increasing amount of deforestation too, but has been doing comparatively well and still has a lot of what we call primary rainforest, forest that hasn't had much human disruption. And what does that look like? Well, the common image of this jungly, tangled mass of vegetation is partly there in these more intact parts of the Osa, but you don't see it at ground level so much. Compared to secondary rainforest, places where there's been big disturbances, even if it was quite a long time ago, Compared to those, the structure here tends to differ in two big ways. First, they are old growth, meaning lots of large old trees with wide spreading canopies. These tend to be some of the first trees to go when loggers come. And two, the undergrowth, while still diverse, isn't all that dense. Because of the large mature canopies covered in smaller vines and other plants, the forest floor is usually pretty dark. Where you see a dense tangle of bushes, vines, and whatnot on the ground, that's where light can reach the forest floor better, or has been able to in the not-so-distant past. 
So when a forest has been mature and undisturbed for a long time, you don't really have a place for these mats of vegetation, outside maybe forest edges, stream sides, and areas where a tree has fallen. This state of the forest will also affect the animal life you'll find there, the habitats available, how easily animals can traverse the ground, which food plants are available, etc. But how has the Osa managed to stay this way? Well, historically, it was a difficult place to colonize. Indigenous populations have lived there quite a while, but there's lots of steep ridges, deep gullies, rivers where it's hard to build good bridges, and just a lot of things that make architecture and urbanization difficult. This is changing more in recent decades, but up to the 80s, most of the peninsula was only accessible either by sea or by trekking through the jungle on foot. On top of that, government protection has helped. Already since the 70s, about a third of the peninsula was designated as Corcovado National Park, with a partially protected surrounding border area. There's also a broader Osa conservation area that extends into the mainland, aimed at monitoring and protecting species in their broader context. Now, is it a perfect system? No, it has its flaws, such as the government often leaving the actual enforcement and potentially dangerous confrontations with poachers and other illegal interlopers up to unpaid volunteers without much support. So there is that blemish in the system, but overall Costa Rica has been doing remarkably well in the conservation department. One goal for further conservation in the area is to try to connect protected areas better. Especially with farms and settlements crowding in, scientists figure that Corcovado isn't big enough to support viable population sizes of some of the larger mammals in the long term. So, one hope is to connect it with the much larger La Amistad International Park, creating and maintaining forest corridors so that animals can pass more safely between areas and maintain a larger gene pool. In doing this, another hope is to help develop farming methods that are more wildlife friendly for pineapples, coffee, and some of the other prominent local crops. And, of course, to reforest unused farmland. Oh, also, for one other thing that makes this place special, for whatever reason, the trees here get pretty tall. Some of the biggest in Latin America, even. One study estimated all other neotropical forests to have an average maximum height of 40 meters. But the Osa? 65 meters. And that's only an average maximum, so you will find trees that are taller than that yet. And not just height, but some studies state that if girth or bulk of trees gets taken into account, they are on average about 33% bigger than in all other tropical American forests. So, what kinds of plants will you find here in the Osa? Well, for obvious reasons, I can't list everything, and what I'm showing is just a small sampling of the common families and groups. Some of these I'll have videos on specifically, though it's much easier for me in my videos to talk about smaller plants found closer to the ground because, turns out, trees where all the leaves are 70 feet above you can be kind of hard to ID and photograph, even with the help of a drone. Even at ground level, though, there is still so much here to explore. Oh yeah, Cecropias, though. Can't go without mentioning Cecropias. Man, just look at those trees. But anyway... Thank you to the Fail Vagabond channel for letting me use, well, Thomas got some great drone shots that he's letting me use, so check out their channel as well. I'm really excited for this video series, so join me as we explore some of the plants that call this place home. From trees that leak milk, to trees that die to support their offspring, to bat fruits and monkey pots and a whole bunch of other stuff. So for those and more, join me next time on Ambling with Sam.